Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have lecture five, Parallel Algorithms and Data Structures. And this is the second part of this lecture. While the first part really introduced us a little bit more to the combination of basically different elements we learned before. We had the domain decomposition part of let's say simple data structures like arrays or matrices. And then we thought about how could MPI work with this distributed idea of having data, right? We talk about distributed memory programming. We always have to send messages back and forth. And then we learned that by using, let's say, smart collective operations like scatter, gather, and then in the end also the reduce operation, we can significantly basically have a simple code created that is very powerful in the end and also scalable. So we don't really define necessarily always exactly the amount of cores that can run with that problem while we basically specify this in the job script. Of course, here and there, the data structure should match what you want to do in terms of parallelization. That becomes more obvious while we have more application examples. Also, of course, examples we have in part one are pretty easy at the beginning, but we also learned that for very advanced application, like for instance, having a fast Fourier transform application for you know doing a deeper analysis of periodic phenomena in signals or so, you can leverage libraries. So other people have, of course, thought about many physical, let's say, problems, physical equations um, that stand the test of time. So, of course, for those, you have really powerful libraries and packages. And the idea to learn some of those is the idea of the second part of this overall HPC course. We will dive in diff different application domains. We gave in the last part, actually, example of DENWP, which is a numerical weather prediction. Um, but also we will have particles, we will have um, well, particle collisions, we will have basically finita elementa and computational fl fluid dynamics, medics and neuroscience applications. So we go in all of these different application fields and then you realize they are governing by different elements of physics. We also will strive a little bit machine learning to just give you an idea that of course GPUs and HPC can be also used for more data intensive sciences, which are not really governed by numerical methods using known physical laws. So a very rich part of the lecture series appetizer here, thinking about parallel algorithms, which of course will be in this course in, in much bigger scale than in the later parts, once we established also perhaps OpenMP, which you know shared memory and other elements which you really have to learn first, like GPUs, accelerators, their role and others. But let us continue here in <clears throat> the second part of the lecture really with some data structures in order to have a much more cleaner code, to have much more um, a way of thinking about uh, patterns when it comes to sending and receiving data over the wire. So one example and basically terminology that we really need to know is essentially here these kind of pipelining and master worker approaches, which is a general phenomena of parallel algorithms a little bit we alluded to this already in a practical example when I thought about the maximum of this array here. And of course, everyone would basically would quickly come up to the idea if I have four people that should count this, let's break it into equal chunks. And then we do the domain decomposition. And for each, we have the local problem solved before we fix the global problem. In order to fix a global problem, there needs to be someone in charge, someone who is tracking what the other workers are doing. And this is usually called the master worker paradigm in parallel computing for parallel algorithms. And you will find many of the applications in real physics and so on are really based on this typical master worker paradigm. Some of you have already heard this also where being part of my cloud computing course, right? Where we talked about Spark, we talked about Hadoop and these more, let's say, Apache projects, open source projects, they employ this also with the master worker paradigm, basically with MapReduce and elements like this. Another sort of parallel algorithms we cover more in the cloud course. Here we think about different elements of thinking how we could basically bring this into MPI. And a little bit you have seen this with a rank zero, often taking some sort of a master or at least initiate the process or you know performing the scatter and with this 
then basically getting the data scattered to all the different workers. And these are, of course, just examples. You can have many different implementations of using this master worker paradigm. And um, this is just one way of data flow. Um, another one, which is basically also often used for job chains in HPC or in generally um, perhaps talking more about pipelines is then when you have the idea of the data flow that goes through it. So you would have data as a kind of key element where you want to compute on and want to basically do something on. And basically then you would have a specific pipeline of data flow that you would go to different stages using parallel computing in different stages with different, let's say equations or with element, different elements perhaps um, when you think about also AI applications, for instance, where you can say the first stage is in parallel doing maybe some data preparation. And then in the second stage, you start with doing some training. And then you do basically some, some validation of that. And you finally testing it. So validation is then the model selection of the AI model, really, of the algorithm. Then finally, you have the idea of working on the data with the so-called test set, making really the final let's say, test if your AI algorithm is really up to the accuracy you want it, and then you drop it to disk in stage five as parallel I.O. So just one example, of course. But in the end, of course, there are different ways how you now can employ parallel computing in your problem. Not everything is always completely parallel, right, which actually shows you this pipelining, for example. Or also think about the beautiful way of thinking, ah, everything can be parallelizable to, to the end to the infinity, right? Which is also not really happening. Immediately when you uh, perhaps think about this picture, you would smell a rat. It's not true, right? Here we would think about, okay, every little core here of MPI process from zero to 15 is same, but the world isn't like that. So someone, needs to think about the big picture. So from one of these 16 cores, although you would say it's perfectly balanced domain decomposition, everybody does it bits and everybody is contributing. What we leave out is a little bit that some of those workers here or process have to have a special role. Maybe it's rank zero. And then of course being the master, but immediately you would think that, okay, he has quite some more work to do than just doing the maximum local A and being involved in all of that. So basically it has also quite some load imbalance here because it also is responsible this rank zero for distributing the data, right? Let's say a scatter and then also getting the maximum back, maybe a reduce of sorts. So, and, and this shows already that the idealized picture of always scaling up, adding more and more processes and then we can speed up forever. You know, everything takes one second. Uh, that's not existing in the real world. So we have limits. And this brings us to the phenomena we have already learned about with Amdahl's law, that the serial limits in the end here and there have problems. We have network limits exploited already. And of course, here is automatically a load imbalance because one of these ranks has to assume a master role. And the master role entails much more work than the other workers have. Automatically, you basically employ a load imbalance. <clears throat> on dealing with this load imbalance, and, and this is, of course, now a key part in, in basically doing HPC with real hands-on problems. Here's a very, let's say, simple idea of how you would, you know, approach such problems and also connecting a bit the bits and pieces why hollow regions can be useful, why they are basically um, required. And the way how you choose now your domain decomposition will of course, have a large effect on the computing of the communication overhead you imply on the problem and, and actually also how much you can get out of the parallelization. And here, two extremes, obviously. Um, one where you would think of you want to compute here the weather or whatever phenomena um, in this basically part of the world, you would say it's really little parallelism, right? When I crept down only these parts in such a granularity, which is perhaps too coarse grained. On the other end of the scale, the question remains if this domain decomposition would be quite useful, because in the end, you would say these cores here have quite heavy things to do, let's say, to compute you know, weather about specific landmarks, while these are not really interested to compute any weather on some ocean parts 
or so to a very, let's say, interesting detail. Maybe this communication overhead would be also too much here because it's too small. So finding the right granularity of C, more or less domain decomposition, and here's an example of a more or less geometric decomposition, is of course something which also has an impact in computing, but also has an impact in data structures, right? We talked about data structures now. When thinking about data structures immediately, you have to think about that our world ends at some point in time because we cannot reach the memory of the other processor. So the data structure that remains in my memory is only accessible by me as a process. So every time someone wants to compute the weather from you know, using a stencil methods that we had in the first part of the course, maybe of getting information from my neighbors requires me to basically send and receive this information, maybe even as a collective with my neighbors. But in the end, it has also impacts on the networking, on the communication overhead. And then we learned that, of course, we do iterative simulations over times, right? That basically every time we compute, let's say the weather at this particular time scale or time step really, then there will be a next time step. And how I actually do this when I don't have the information about the previous time step, I do this Harlow regions. Right, so basically you do this kind of more or less data hollow bulk swapping. We call that perhaps a bit, if you want to have the the, the little bit jargon of the HPC community, um, where basically in each of these intervals that you do, you really have to do this neighboring cell exchange of data. And by doing this, um, this of course is, is basically giving you now one iteration of the overall simulation. Then you continue in time, iterate again, do the physics computation and again reaching to some point where you have to exchange the halos again and iterate and compute and exchange the halos again. So basically it will become part of your parallel algorithm to think about this and key to this is of course partly the data structure. Now think about what the weather could probably be influencing. So wind speed, um, you probably have the temperatures and this is a really let's say simplified way of doing it. I'm not an earth scientist. So um, please bear with me. But in the end, you would can consider that probably the data structures you exchange to compute accurately the weather there, uh, you can imagine, and we will learn in lecture 15 much more in detail, this is hell a lot of variables that actually determine then and actually have an influence in this. So hence, in order to compute perhaps perfect precipitation maps and sorts, you need lots of exchanges of this data, and this also means we have to think about more data structures and how they are exchanged over the wire to your neighboring processors. So <clears throat> here we again have the example of the too large and too, too little, so to speak, communication, um, or basically the domain decomposition. You have here this chunks of data that we really want to achieve. And of course here, and, and that is a little bit the load imbalance. Um, what I wanted to show is essentially this is a key problem, right? The load imbalance. And, and what we see here um, essentially is a very good example of this. You have here the main country in the halos. Everything is full of data. So lots of you know work to be done for this process if you have one working on it. And you see here a domain decomposition part, which is same the same application domain problem, but here is just a couple of halos filled, and actually the the compute of the middle of the core is really almost nothing compared to the other one. So this would be directly a, a very bad domain decomposition in a sense because you have one let's say with little bit computing with little bit of communication, you know, exchanging the halos here. But then on the other hand, have here lots of computation and lots of communication need because the halos are full of data um, to other processors. Hence, you would think about, let's throw more processes to it and more processes to it and more processes to it. But in the end, um, you cannot really make it perfect. So there's this load imbalance problems that will you know, kick in at some point in time you have serial limits. We already learned about, you know, MPI units, MPI finalization, the MPI environment, creating the parallel environment. This all has serial limits. Maybe some IO serial parts you will be uh, using for initialize your problem. 
space, like here loading the Mona Lisa into your space of you know all the processes, which maybe is loaded by one process and then distributed to all the others with this master worker paradigm. Whatever it is, Gustav Law basically says us also, of course, for this, in a way, we didn't use computing, right? Idea was when we need larger problems in a way, right? Amdahl's law says clearly the limits is in the serial parts, but of course, in order to advance and then using speed up to your, let's say benefit, we need rather Gustafsson's law to acknowledge and say, um, in order to do more larger CPUs and uh, just basically increase always the processes is not the solution. We have to increase the problem space. Um, and the, the kind of ideas to the granularity, whatever it is you want to compute in order to basically um, bas use the processor power. So <clears throat> coming to this example um, brings us also to some interesting questions. If a domain decomposition where everything is always equal is really the right choice. And I think the best way, not only the country you've just seen, right, with having perhaps parts of the rest of the country, which is, you know, maybe underutilizing the resources you have in HPC, um, but the best way to really, I think, better understand it is this long and short term interactions that we have in, in basically in particles in physics. Obviously, the interaction of those is, is governed by equations of physics we already know. Um, force fields and so on. And we will learn more about this in the second half of this, you know, HPC course. But here it's just thinking a little bit about the domain decomposition. If you want to compute basically the interactions of these particles, yeah, these are all different particles somewhere in space and you're interested in the interaction of this particle with all the others and you have a certain force field. So in the next iteration, giving the force um, that can be given by all of these particles, how it influences the position basically of me and of course of all the others, um, how I basically do this iteratively and do I really want to do a more blocky, you know, kind of domain decomposition here and why I shouldn't. Of course, you can immediately see this picture says it all in a way, um, the distance matter, right? And with the distance, it means perhaps the ones that are really in the short term uh, or short interactions here, short range interactions really. Um, these are perhaps very important for my force fields. It will actually give me quite some input on how my force field will be influenced and where my position of the particle would be. But in the long range interactions, let's say these four particles, we can imagine their force field will influence me, of course it will, it's physics, so probably there's some space in between. And basically, we have to acknowledge that there's something existing. But maybe because they're four very far away and almost at the same space, we can treat them more or less at one. So we have here a domain decomposition that suggests that short range interactions and long range interactions, and of course, the threshold for the definition of those being short or long range, will be, of course, up to you as an application designer. But still, we can already understand that instead of computing then many, many different particles again with these different force fields, we maybe can have a domain decomposition where we treat many of these particles more or less as one and then do the interaction computing. In another view, you already should realize that this looks not any more really Cartesian oriented, right? Like this blocky character here where I maybe want to compute to everyone. I rather interested in these particles and their space where they are. So in the end, it, we can have this domain decomposition in a way chunked down as a tree. And this is the idea of this particular Pepsi um, solver that you have here, which you can use for n-body simulations. And it's basically enable you to do still realistic simulations of these n-body systems or particles. And always scaling up, of course, is the thing that of course we're interested in, in in parallel computing. So how that works <clears throat> and how you use this Pepsi solver is then essentially giving us another perspective of data structures. So here you would think about more of having a so-called tree um, simulation space on different levels of granularity. And of course, um, always the nearby cells here would be treated very individually 
um, you would of course have this short range interactions which matter to me a lot. But in order to have this long range interactions, you see here on the right hand scale from level one to level two, we already have here some, let's say not so important factors. We can see that essentially here the tree informs of course and the the let's say more shorter range interactions in a so-called tree-based approach and with this of course i achieve high performance um, by basically thinking about that many of these distant cells right that you would have here and all of them have different particles they actually then in the end more or less treated as one particle uh, which you interact with and with this you can save a lot of computing time and with this make your computing much more faster and you see here, people have done there some computing science and software engineering methods of really encapsulate, so to speak, the tree code algorithm. So it's also used for different, uh, let's say, um, you know, applications of sort. Here you see it's, of course, used for the PEPC, um, the pretty efficient power column server, and you know, using elements of the so-called Barnes Hood tree code here for n-body problems. But it can be used also for different applications in order to have different models. So in the end, you talk about another domain decomposition variety that you can basically use. And of course, by using this with particles means um, saving a lot of computational time. So thinking then how that would look like as a, as a tree data structure, while of course the interaction computing wise is still based on the laws of physics, um, basically with, the, with these force fields and the interactions, we're thinking now about the tree data structure where you come from the root, employing the first level of the tree, and then essentially dive deeper here in the level of the tree, like suggested here on the right hand side, where you then maybe extend only on a couple of nodes, because here is just one, you know, particle in. So here we talk about already about a leaf node. Then we cut the domain smaller into pieces, in a way still thinking Cartesian, is always having this blocky character. But over time, when you dive into the tree, having not really a proper Cartesian anymore, but rather this so-called tree representation of this domain decomposition, right? Where the leaves then are the real particles you interact with. And at some point in time, so you'd cut the tree and say, I just treat those particles basically as one. And with this can, you know, on a certain level of tree, achieve high performance. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, so let's think about a more um let's say interesting approach of of a problem you would may now think is in a way very cumbersome so many of the you know sometimes questions i get in a q a or basically in other uh, discussions with this is if you just have to have mpi send and receive and then basically have this primitive values you already learned so i have an integer and i want to have you know five integers of the wire i say it's mpi int Fantastic. Then I receive five, you know, integers. But um, what do I do with arrays? What do I do with multidimensional data sets? Do I really want to have four loops again and again, where the value is in, where the different data types are in? And basically also thinking about how I allocate this on the other side as a receiving end, right? To have this kind of um, data somehow in a so-called contiguous memory space to enable high performance. There must be something smart in MPI to enable high performance. And this is often a little bit, let's say, not so easy to understand. That's why I establish it step by step and also, of course, give you some derived data types then um, as examples for handling those, let's say, multidimensional data sets and different data types, perhaps. But the first thing to understand is really there are these primitive data types, which more or less are equal to our normal programming language. Right, you would say MPI int is a typical integer. Float you have heard about double precision, this MPI double, and so forth, or a char. But in the end, what happens now if we would have a struct of sorts? So basically, I want not only you know five integers, I want to have one char, two integers, five doubles, as an example, over the wire. So I do I have to send then and receive only per data type is of course quite some limitation, especially if I do iterative this, um, you know, in all the hollow regions, if you remember, right? In every time step, maybe, to compute the actual equation in my own domain, decomposition part, I need the neighbor information. So basically, 
perhaps I have a send and receive with the Harlow region exchange every time step. And this could mean lots of communication overhead to always initiate MPI send, always wait for MPI receive to receive it and so forth. So what could be smarter options in this kind of problem we are in, right? So thinking about me as a process being among very many others, but I have lots of data to share um, to many others around me and the neighbors, and I have lots of data to get from many of those is the key of the idea. Um, hence, this brings us to something we call an MPI, the derived MPI data types. And of course, this is something which is perhaps best explains when I do the demo in 5.1 in our practical lecture. So here and there, it's a bit conceptual, but think about memory spaces. Think about that, of course, it would be fast if this different data types, or basically even if it's a string, right? A couple of chars together as a string, be in contiguous ways of, of memory spaces, not to basically lose performance at that end. And the way how you work with this, you basically construct a new data by of your own, based, of course, on the basic MPI data types you have learned. And then you commit the new data type, essentially with MPI type commit to the MPI environment, right? That you created within it, um, basically. And then it's known by everyone who is in this environment from the processes. And then you can really use the advantage of this data type. You use it in send receive operations and other operations. But everybody knows that this particular data type has, for instance, two chars, five integers, and one double or so. And by using this, of course, you can incredibly increase the usability of the code, the performance of the code. You know, you don't have many, many for loops always doing the same thing with different integers, moving through arrays and so on. Here you can have quite complex data types already created that more or less mimic your domain values. Right, maybe precipitation values, um, wind levels, um, whatever it is, uh, the, the speed of a particle, and, and so on. So the velocity and things like that. So basically, the location and space you can can tune it to your own application domain problem at hand, and that's what people are doing. And of course, here the 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 idea is the mapping of the understanding then to interpret this what you send around, and basically this new data type will help you then. Um, to really use this data types consistently in the application. And there are a wide variety of possible constructs how you can already create one. You can have MPI type contiguous, a vector, indexed, struct, and so forth. And we'll show you some examples. While I would basically think we go here a little bit faster through it, because in the end, the point is that um, Essentially, the practical lecture shows it much more easy and clearly, I think, with practical examples coming then next week. So coming a little bit to the conceptual point of view, um, I think this is pretty obvious. You have allocation of data types uh, into contiguous locations. So for this, you can create the MPI type contiguous. Basically, that is then the, the old type um, and, and writing in it so called the new type, right? And good example is here um, basically, and the empress end means there's something in it written. So from then on, the string type is known and you can use it if you commit it in the MPI environment. The idea here would be, let's say have 100 chars in order to make up our string um, allocated contiguously in memory to also save time when you read and write it and send buffers around. You commit it as we discussed so that the whole MPI environment knows about this and knows about this new data type you created. Once you have done this, it's available in your, all your different applications. You still have your communicator, of course, and all the other information we learned, the status, tag, and so on. And you still need, of course, a buffer to fill it, right? You just have a data type here, but you need a, a real, um, let's say, a real um, variable for it, right? So something which is leveraging this 100 chars, which you see essentially here, is then uh, giving you this buffer value of having this basically going over. One example, another one of a derived MPI data set is definitely um, the vector. And as it is suggesting, you can have here the MPI type vector um, in, in different um, elements defined. Uh, the same structure remains. You would define the details and then have an old type where you compile it from the basic MPI data types. 
but then coming to some new type, right? And the way how that looks like then is to think a little bit about where you basically could um, foresee this layout. When you think here, it's the count, which is the first. So we would have five times this one of the block length two, right? So this is the block length. And then we want to basically allocate it in memory um, in, in specific parts where we say uh, the buffer really to have this blockwise locations where you say the stride of all of this would be three. So you see every time the block is now new starting is actually then you know, having one free about it because the stride is free. So every time we have here one of these um, count fulfilled in the block, we wait one or basically have the stride until the next one. And here's a idea how you can do this. You have a contiguous MPI three with three integers, which makes up a good number. You say um, you commit this, and it also shows you that in order to use MPI derived data types, you can use a derived data type as well in order to derive a more powerful one. So they build on each other because in the end, they're just data types. And here you see how that works. You have basically three times integer, which is good numbers. But then the vector that we want to create is of, you know, three, two, three as an example, which is good numbers. So all of them are actually three MPIs that I want to fill here. But then with the vector idea of saying, um, I basically have three of them. That's what we already know. Then we basically have here the idea of the block which is more or less this two, and then the stride of three would be the same setup, but instead of five, I have, of course, just three. But instead of just saying, um, essentially, the the typical MPI int or something, I use already a derived data type here in order to create another derived data type that, I of course, call lots of good numbers that I have also to commit to the MPI environment. And then I can create quite powerful data um, structures really that of course simplified the code enormously if you think about mpi send here um, using the buffer and then lots of good numbers instead of many different you know lines of codes which would be for instance just sending and receiving some good numbers while i can just you know send the whole of lots of lots of good numbers in one row and this basically simplifies of course lots of your application readability the performance, the communication overhead for each of these significantly. And then let's say a more broader perspective would be then the index ones. It's more or less obvious where then can have, let's say, a block of um, having different, you know, integer types or whatever it is that you want to really have from the old type. Um, and then this place then really more or less on an index point of view. So you have here a block length. So how long should the block length be? Two, three, one, two, two, etc. Be below here. And then the displacements, which are more or less the indices really of these different blocks um, where you want to allocate it then. And then basically you have this indexed way. You say there are six of them um, and you give the different areas that show you the block lengths and the indices and have the new type resulting from this. Right. I think we come to more and more ideas in this and you will see with this, we can create very powerful algorithms, which I show you in practical lecture one, uh, 5.1 much more. But at, towards the end of the course here today in the part two, um, let us reveal a little bit also the MPI IO interesting aspects in it. You learned this already on this MPI IO parallel file system approach. I can really have this high level IO libraries, which are then interacting with MPI IO in order to leverage the parallel file system. And HDF, the hierarchical data format, is one of the standards in the community I want to give you example from. For instance, when you have the application problem that we have lots of points in the space, and then with Euclidean distance, you maybe want to realize if this is one cluster and another one. So those which have the shortest distance form basically a cluster. And the direct interpretation, how that works, is basically something you can look up in a data mining book. Essentially, there are several rules um, based on the so-called DB scan algorithm that we also implemented in parallel with one of my PhD students and is, I think, the most scalable DB scan algorithm in the world right now. And correct me if I'm wrong or if you find a better scalable one. 
working with MPI and OpenMP. And essentially what you do here is you specify the certain data set with your data of all these clustering points, right? In the beginning, they are not clustered. At the end results, you would have to have these clustered points out. And essentially you see here that we do this with a so-called overlaid grid, but immediately you already know um, and this is alluding to what we learned here today, that of course the load imbalance will kick in because all the data points are not at the same position. So the load imbalancing would be here, you know, quite significant. Hence, we don't cut it in the middle. We would do a much more smart, smart cost estimation of what it probably would cut, cost here to, to do these clustering algorithms. And we'll do Harlow exchanges here, essentially, after we've done the local debut scan. We essentially, of course, will think about how we can have this, this HALO exchanges in order to help with cluster relabeling, because of course, the merging of the HALOs means we maybe form one cluster here, which is obvious, right, compared to those. So it will be also one application we look later in detail, but just thinking about how we do this now in terms of data storage, we have, of course, here defined ways of storing the data as a HDF5 um, file system, so to speak. If you want to look HDF, it is actually looking a little bit like a file system within a file, right? You see here, uh, you have a root, and then from the root, you have this slash foo, and then you have maybe images, you have tables, arrays, and then you go to another part of the, let's say, um, file, which is essentially representing a file in a file. How it looks on the file system then, is essentially just this. You see here Bremen and Bremen Small are basically point clouds of the Bremen inner city, but still one file, large file, right? When you think about um, the file size here to be analyzed with a typical, um, let's say, clustering algorithm. And with HDF5 as a library, um, you actually can use this. It's actually using and enabling that binary files can be stored and read and also Basically, all the processes are directly involved by using the MPI IO, if you remember, right? So this is a parallel file access where concurrent access to file writing and reading from the Bremen small data and big data here is possible. And we implemented this in the HDB scan algorithm. And of course, for this, we have different data types of different types would make up a record then that we give here in this. And this is just one example of a so-called compound type that you can create, of course, then with different simple ones again, right? Integers of certain sizes or arrays of floats, where of course you are in charge now to define how actually the, the inner life of this so-called HDF5 system looks like. And it's that, as such as of course, it is a really domain application problem. And you integrate this then in the job script. We are by using just, you know, basically these, these different data sets with having specifications on the file system level where they are, um, you know, big data or small data, and then use this with your MPI application here. So we, we look in this in lecture 10 more deeply, um, also how HDF5 then actually looks like um, on, and how this is really stored in the ID. I think for today, it was already lots of, let's say, content and quite complex content partly but I want to in turn then give you a very stimulating example um, where HPC is used for cutting edge engineering, which is the airline industry. So we will look at ANSYS, a very powerful package using MPI, OpenMP, uh, really to in really highly scalable applications uh, in practice in real application problems. It's a bit of a longer video, but still it captures really a nice essence of what you can do with MPI and parallel computing in real life applications. The modern aircraft is an engineering marvel, the epitome of a smart system, an intricate balance of hardware and software technologies operating across extreme environments, performing safely, reliably, and predictably, performing as promised. To reach this level of performance, the aerospace industry demands accurate, fast, and reliable simulation technology supported by scalable and cost-effective IT solutions that leverage high-performance computing as well as cloud and mobile technology 
to empower robust design methodologies offered in an integrated multi-physics environment, allowing aerospace engineers to collaborate across disciplines, departments, and even continents. Aerospace has led the way with simulation-driven design processes amplified through automation, customization, and a seamless user experience empowering engineers of all experience levels to truly extend the boundaries of innovative design. They have trusted the most advanced simulation tools for both single physics and full mechatronic system modeling. Tools that are accurate, fast, and reliable. The technology, vision, and strategy of ANSYS stand alone as the leading provider of critical modeling and robust simulation solutions for the aerospace industry, enabling our customers to consistently realize their product promise. How exactly does the aerospace industry rely on ANSYS? In more ways than you would think. Today, fuel and environmental performance have become mission critical in our industry. Starting with engine performance, ANSYS provides critical simulation best practices in the areas of flow path aerodynamics, aeromechanics, thermal design, and combustion processes. Specific solutions include stress and modal analysis, heat transfer for high temperature operation, rotor dynamics, compressor aerodynamics, turbine aerodynamics, and blade row aeromechanics. In reducing the weight of the aircraft, ANSYS provides simulation capabilities for advanced composite materials that are faster than traditional methods and allow for thermal and electrical properties to address the challenge of multifunctional composites. ANSYS continues to participate in industry-leading consortia to advance aerodynamic design. A portfolio of coupled physics enables multidisciplinary optimization to deliver higher fidelity understanding of aircraft performance throughout the flight envelope. With the increase of electronic systems, ANSYS is focused on providing simulation best practices for electric machine design, antenna design, mechatronics, and thermal management. We recognize that with more electronic systems comes the dramatic rise in the number of embedded software lines of code. Through the SCADE family of products, ANSYS provides software that delivers FAA-certified embedded code that is automatically generated. This can reduce the overall time to deliver certified code by 50% compared with manual or non-certified code generation methods. Beyond performance, passenger safety and comfort are paramount concerns for any airline. Whether it's for icing, blade impact and damage, bird strike, lightning strike, or crashworthiness, ANSYS provides a portfolio of technology to support the development of the safest aircraft. As a member of the Cabin Air Reformative Environment, or CARE Consortium, ANSYS is using modeling and simulation to improve the in-cabin air quality and control the spread of disease in flight. ANSYS also provides a suite of aeroacoustic and vibroacoustic solvers to significantly reduce noise, comply with industry regulations, and improve the passenger experience. Highly complex, intricately interconnected, the modern aircraft is a smart system unlike any other, requiring the most advanced hardware and software simulation technologies available. Simulation-driven solutions provided by ANSYS, specifically for the aerospace industry, enable you to realize your product promise. <clears throat> so, that was hopefully... Uh very let's say promising example how hpc is used and we have a little bit of answers later also in this course of course not at the scale maybe of an aircraft uh, which is really cutting edge and obviously a multi-million business but here in the course we cut it a little bit down in the cfd 
um, lecture that you will basically embark on. But of course, before we reach this, uh, the second part of this course, really, we have to learn a little bit more with HPC. We have to learn a little bit more the basics, really, that we have basically um, improved on today a little bit with data structures and also the general thinking of parallel algorithms. And the next time we will have really a practical lecture, 5.1, how I will demonstrate you all of these codes in practice, which are then, of course, again, related to another assignment that you have to solve at some point in time after finishing your assignment one. So talk to you next time.